T.G. Shepard has always had the unstoppable passion for music, and that passion, combined with a steadfast dedication to entertainment, has made him one of the most popular live performers in country music today. Now, with 21 number one hit songs, his live concerts are packed full of his chart-topping tunes like Last Cheater's Waltz, I Loved Him Every One, and Do You Want to Go to Heaven? And T.G. recently celebrated the 40th anniversary of his number one hit single, Slow Burn, in 2023, which was released in 1983 and was the title track of the hit album as well. Now, Slow Burn became his 13th number one hit, spending 14 weeks in the top 40. Now, the album also included the popular single Somewhere Down the Line and Make My Day with Clint Eastwood, which was added to the record for a re-release in February of 1984 and used in the hit film Sudden Impact. Today, it's all about Valentine's Day with a new single with his wife Kelly Lang, You're Still the One. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome back country music superstar and friend T.G. Shepard to the show. You, you welcome. talking about me? <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's quite an introduction. Where do I send the check? Oh, you know my address. <laughs> yeah, I do. That's good to, it's good to see you again. Man, it is always good to see you. And uh, I know that uh, you and Kelly are putting out a new single for Valentine's Day, the duet. Uh, and you chose the Shania Twain hit, You're Still the One. Why was that song special? Well, you know, we, we did a, an album years ago called Iconic Duets, and it did so well. And people kept saying through the years, <clears throat> when are you going to come back and do another duet album? And we just, each time we just pick our favorite songs that we've loved for years. And this time around, Kelly came up with that idea of You're Still the One. Uh, we had seen uh, Shania in Vegas not long ago and caught her show and thought it was great. And I don't know. It, Kelly said, let's make a duet out of that. And I really and truly think it made a great duet as opposed to just uh, her her hit on uh, her album. But uh, no, it was, uh, I don't know. They, these projects are a labor of love because I get a chance to go in the studio with not just a singer, but my wife. And it's just, we're so in tune with each other on what we want uh, in the studio and how we want it to be and uh, I'm blessed to uh, be married to somebody who loves what I do and as much as I love what she does. So, well, when but you anyway, go, Kelly came up with that idea on that song. Well, when you go into the studio, uh, are do you are you able to read each other's minds? A little bit. Now, I am I am really too. I mean, I have lyric sheets in front of me. Okay, and if and if. I mean, I follow it word for word to make sure that I get it right. And Kelly just flies by the seat of her pants, okay? She already knows the song. She's got a memory like an elephant. Just She never forgets lyrics to songs. And so um, we, we, we jailed pretty good in there, but, but mine is a little, it's a little harder for me, but it comes easy for her. But we... Uh, we manage to get across to each other uh, what we want. And yeah, we, we do a little bit of uh, uh, reading each other's minds when it comes to certain lines we want to take. Because when you do a duet, it, it's, it sounds easy for two people to sing, but the lyric has got to mean something to the person that's saying it. And in a duet, you've also got the problem of having the right key to sing in because Usually, singers don't sing in the same key. So you have to modulate in some places to get into the right key for your partner on a record, or you just have to sing higher or lower to make it work. But uh, it, it's worked pretty good. But yeah, we, we read each other's mind quite a bit in studio. Well, when you take a song like Shania's song that is sung by a single artist, right. uh, how long does it usually take to break down a song like that to make it a duet? Well, really not that long. Um, what really takes a long time is just uh, the vocal, your vocals uh, interpretation. It has to be believable. You can't just go in and open your mouth and start singing a bunch of words. So you have to make sure that when you are tracking a song and singing it, that you've got feeling in it. Because the person listening to you when you're done with it, 
they can tell if you're into it or not, or if you're just mouthing the words for a, a buck to sell your album. And that's not what it's about with us. We really like to feel the music. So uh, it, it's not really that hard. I mean, we, we pretty much know, you know, we'll be singing along and I'll go, I think that line would be good for you to say that. And then she'll go, I think it'd be good if you said this line. So it really not that hard. Not really. It just kind of comes together and happens. Well, what do you normally do for Kelly on Valentine's Day? Anything she wants. <laughs> this year, we're going to see Tina Turner's review, the show here in Nashville. Um, we wanted to see it on Broadway, but we, for some reason, I think COVID hit at that time and we didn't get a chance to go. And then uh, the next day we fly out uh, to go to Texas uh, on the 16th to do a, a show in, uh, in Granbury, Texas. And uh, so Valentine's Day is usually always flowers, of course. You know, you gotta have, gotta have some flowers and oh. a nice car. Well, yeah. what's Kelly's favorite flower? Oh, she loves all flowers, but I, I think she kind of likes roses. You know, what woman doesn't like a couple of dozen red roses sitting by her bed? You know, yeah. when they wake up. You know? you, well, but, do you remember your first Valentine's Day with Kelly? Sort of. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I get reminded of this a lot. I, I, I didn't forget, but I wound up not really having anything, and so I went to Walgreens. And I went through the aisles and I just started grabbing stuff to put in a bag. And it didn't go over very well. I should have gone to a jewelry store or bought something nice, but I was under pressure. I realized the day of that I didn't have anything. So I drove down to Walgreens, they were open and I don't know, I might've gotten a pair of reading glasses to put in there and maybe uh, some candy and it, it didn't go over really well but i do remember that first one it, it wasn't great but i've gotten better i've been well trained we can be trained you know oh oh yeah 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 i think we've <laughs> all had that walgreens experience on yes, valentine's yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think i can remember a few of my own and they never yeah. go over well <laughs> no they don't they don't but i've gotten better through the years i've been more attentive and and i have been trained properly by kelly so well, with, with, because both of you are recording artists and you have toured forever, uh, have most of your Valentine's days been on the road? A lot of them. Yeah. I, you know, most artists miss a lot of those memorable days with their partner because the career really and truly uh, dictates your life. It, it kind of controls your life. And when you're out doing a tour, it's difficult to break off the tour just to come home for Valentine's and then go back out. But uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've missed a few, but I've, I've always tried to watch the calendar to the point to where if it's really an important date or an anniversary or something very special, I try to make a point to be home. Uh, but it's not always the, always the case. Well, what is, uh, what is you and Kelly's favorite song or favorite love song together? Wow. On the new album, we've got two or three that I really like, the new album. Uh, my favorite is, is one that we, we did a remake of the Kenny Rogers song, Morning Desire. It's a great record. It was a big hit for him. And uh, that one, and we did a remake of the old Spiral Staircase. I love you more today than yesterday. Uh, we did that. So those, those are two of my favorites now. As far as her, I don't really, really know. But, uh, oh, I like them all when I'm singing with Kelly. You know, they're all, they're all my favorite, they're all special. Well, I have to, I have to ask you because uh, and this is a this is an all man question because th because this is the month of February, and you and I both know that's when NASCAR season kicks off at the Daytona oh, 500. Yeah. So yes. what what are some of your fondest memories being an associate sponsor of the twenty five fold your Chevrolet with Tim Richmond and Ken Ken Schrader? Well, it racing has changed through the years. 
I loved racing when it was a lot of the smaller tracks. It's gone to the super speedways now of Las Vegas and Kansas City and uh, but I, I miss the smaller tracks because that's really where NASCAR was born was rural people put their race cars together and put them on the back of a truck and drove them in to race on Sundays. My most memorable times was standing in the winner's victory circle in Daytona when our car won uh, the Firecracker 400 uh, with Tim Richmond. We won a lot of big races, but that was a very memorable day. And then in NASCAR, tragedy strike and those become memorable days. Like I was also there the day that my dear friend Dale Earnhardt passed. And I just was in shock. It just did not look like that bad of a crash. But it was just, it was just his time, okay? But uh, no, racing to me is something that I grew up on. My dad used to take me to the old dirt tracks as a kid. And I, I watched, uh, racing from there and then got turned on to NASCAR and had the opportunity to work with Rick Hendrick at Hendrick Motorsports with Tim Richmond, as you said, and, and Ken Schrader. And then I had Mark Martin as my driver for a while when I moved over to Jack Roush. So I was, I was afforded a great luxury of being with the big guys, uh, car owners, uh, builders, uh, Hendrick and uh, Roush. Oh, when you were with the 25 Folgers Chevrolet, what's the main difference between Tim Richmond and Ken Schrader? Tim was like Earnhardt. He was an ironhead. He would take chances that most drivers wouldn't take to win a race. And sometimes that's just what it takes is getting out there on the edge and doing a little more than the guy behind you is doing to win. Okay. I used to get so tickled at Tim. I remembered one race. I forget. It might have been Atlanta. I forget now. We we didn't we didn't win the race, but we were close to winning. And Tim knew that he wasn't going to win the race, but he wanted that TV time, okay? Because the sponsors want that name Folgers on TV. Millions are watching. So all of a sudden, uh, Tim crashed. Big crash roll over blind, just horrible looking. And I, after the race, I said, what happened? He said, TV time. I said, you TV time, you crashed to get TV. He said, what did you see in the paper the next day? You didn't see the guy in the winter circle. It showed the car up in the air. Our sponsor got coverage. <laughs> so it was, uh, Tim was, a different kind of driver compared to Schrader or any other driver. He was just a live. He lived on the edge. And of course the movie uh, days of thunder, they came in and took our team and built the movie days of thunder with Tom Cruise. And Tom played the part of Tim Richmond. Uh, Robert Duvall played the part of Harry Hyde, my crew chief. Quaid played the part of Rick Hendrick. And so it was a, an incredible thing to see that happen. And, be on the set when they were filming that movie. Wow. So that was actually based on the 25 on my team. Folgers I, team. Yes, sure it was. Because they called Tim Richmond Hollywood Tim. Okay. And he rode the motorcycles. And if you remember correctly, in Days of Thunder, Tom Cruise, motorcycle. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was patterned after our team. And it was, uh, and matter of fact, that's when he met Nicole Kidman. Uh, she was in the movie, played the doctor, I believe. Yeah. And uh, they became husband and wife. And, uh, but yeah, the, those, uh, those days of racing uh, are just, uh, matter of fact, I got a call the other day from Hendrick Motorsports. They're getting ready to reissue the 25 race car, the uh, cast car, the little model. Yeah. And they're going out with those. And so, and that was kind of a compliment to after all this time that they're still they're celebrating the 40th anniversary of Hendrick Motorsports and they're making up a mock 25 TG Shepard Folgers car. So it's kind of exciting. Wow, that's really yeah. cool. I mean, 40 yeah. years. I cannot believe it's been that long. I can't either. I mean, well, you know, racing, though, uh, it, I mean, 
I came along in racing at a time when country artists were not into racing that much. The only other person in racing at that time was Burt Reynolds, and they had this gold bandit car with Hal Needham. And Hal Needham did a lot of Burt's movies, produced them. And then all of a sudden, all country artists had their name on race cars. Tanya Tucker had one, and then somebody else. Because really and truly, the NASCAR fan is a country fan. They're rural, uh, and even the big city now. Uh, those same fans are uh, country fans and NASCAR fans. So our visibility grew drastically when we got involved in NASCAR and with Folgers. Well, when you're, if, if you, being a country star, especially back in the 80s, and mm -hmm. you're sponsoring a NASCAR race car, especially with, a Hendri with Hendrix, uh, was there any return on investment for that exposure? Oh gosh, yes. Well, well, I had a contract which was very nice. I mean, uh, when the checks came, they were wonderful, <laughs> and they came every quarter. Uh, as far as sharing in the winnings of the money, a lot of times that's between the car owner, which was Rick Hendrick, and uh, and the driver and the crew. So, uh, but no, I had a personal services contract with Procter & Gamble through Folgers, which paid me handsomely to be involved. And therefore I was, if I wasn't in concert on Sunday, I was at the track by the car in the pits. I mean, it was, I remember one year um, I was in the pits and I didn't know this guy was going to be there. And the car came in uh, for a pit stop several laps into the race in Atlanta. And I look over and there's Huey Lewis handing Tim Richmond water on a stick. And I'm going, I didn't even know he was going to be. A lot of big people would show up at these races and, you know, crew Tom Cruise or whoever. Uh, and uh, I used uh, Paul, uh, uh, Paul Newman. I mean, I hung out with Paul at the, at the tracks and uh, because he was a, a race car driver himself, loved to race. But uh, no, it, it, racing uh, has afforded me the luxury of meeting a lot of great people that necessarily I might not have met any other way. You know, one of the biggest gearheads in Hollywood was has always been, besides James Garner, was Clint Eastwood. Yep. Oh yeah, oh gosh, yeah. And of course, Clint, man, he, of course, Clint at 90 something still making movies, come on, uh, and, and doing them great. <clears throat> and um, and then uh, James Garner, I, I remember meeting James the first time. It wasn't at a racetrack, but it was at La Las Colinas Country Club. We were doing the Larry Gatlin Muscular Dystrophy Golf Tournament. And I'm walking up the fairway up to the green, and I heard somebody singing, Do You Want to Go to Heaven, my song. And I'm going, it's not a radio. Somebody's actually singing it. And I look over, and it's James Garner singing my song and i'm going you know who i am he said well i listen to your music all the time so it, it was kind of cool to hear you mention his name because i remember the day i met him for the first time when we became friends so. yeah i had the opportunity to interview james's daughter Gigi garner yeah i know Gigi. yeah, yeah. She's still living in Nashville, I think. and we had an incredible interview because it was it was all based on james sure and yeah. uh and it was she was shocked because I brought up I don't I don't know if you re, you probably remember this because only car guys will know this is that James Garner had an Oldsmobile Cutlass that he had built for the Baja and he called yes. it the Banshee. Yes, and I do. She remember. was shocked yeah. that I even knew about it. I said I got photos. I'm surprised of that car. you know that. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. But no, James Garner. Um, you you probably don't know this, but. Kelly, you know, Kelly, like my wife, for people watching us, her dad absolutely was the twin to James Garner. If you put them side by side, they would look like identical twins. It was amazing. And so every time I even see a movie now with James Garner, I, I think of Kelly's dad, you know, because they look so much alike. But yeah, Gigi's a good friend, and I don't know if she's still living in Nashville or not, but she, I've known her for a long time. You know, you 
are <clears throat> so busy. How amazed are you about this 1980s country music resurgence? I'm in shock over it, first of all, because I'm, I'm, I'm doing more concerts than ever. And there's a return to uh, my era of music. And a lot of people, well, I, I stand on stage and I look out and I see people in their teens and 20s singing the words back to me. And I'm saying, how do they know the words to these songs? This was before they were born. These songs were number one. So in the meet and greets after shows, I'll say, how do you, how do you know the songs? Well, are you kidding me? My mom and dad, I heard them playing these songs forever. So the reason for that resurgence is that a lot of the fans of real country music are missing that now in music. I, I, I mean, I like a lot of the new music, don't get me wrong, but I still miss the Haggards and the Joneses and the Waylands and that sound. Uh, and so people are, are, are starving to go back to artists of that era. And I happen to be in that era. Well, in the and 1980s, well, in the 1980s, there was you, was it uh, Randy Travis? Randy Travis, the Gatlins. The Gatlins. Was, it, was that, was that yeah. the big era for Ronnie Millsap? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, we toured together and had the same manager. Um, the same person that managed Charlie Pride was our manager, uh, Ronnie and I was manager. And uh, yeah, Ronnie was uh, was on fire back then. Uh, Lee Greenwood. I mean, that's right. Lee we Greenwood. were all out there together, and and that we we were fortunate to get into what the urban cowboy movement was. When Travolta put on a cowboy hat and boots, it became the thing in Hollywood or anywhere. Country music exploded. So. I was on tour with Mickey Gilley and Johnny Lee and Lee Greenwood doing the Urban Cowboy Tour. And it was just, it was like an explosion. You could tell from one day to the next what happened. It was just, when that movie hit, it was Katie barred the door. And it's been that way ever since. It, it was, because I still remember the day because they filmed Urban Cowboy in... Pasadena, Texas, at at the yep. real Gillies, at, yep. at, at the original yep. Gillies, and wow. yep. I still remember because that was nineteen seventy eight or seventy nine when they were filming Urban Cowboy, and it just so happened that the Bee Gees were in town for a concert and we were, we had sixth row seats for the Bee Gees concert. Wow. And it, and it was really a, <clears throat> it was a, it was a, it was a double whammy that night because it was when Andy was on stage with his, th with, with the other brothers, with the know, brothers, Barry, yeah. Robin Morris. And right. so that, and, and that hadn't happened before. To have all four Gibb brothers together. Then, during the encore, John Travolta, because he was filming Urban Cowboy, makes right. a surprise appearance on stage in the encore, sing and singing We Should Be Dancing. And he had the beard. He was still wearing, basically, his clothes from Urban Cowboy oh, when wow. he walked on stage. The whole place erupted. I thought the uh, roof had to come off. Erupted. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Well, I, you know, I, I, Kelly and I had dinner with John uh, not long ago with Olivia before she passed. And of course, everybody knows that my wife, Kelly and Olivia were very close and we were in Florida and uh, Olivia said, we're having dinner with John Travolta. And I said, yeah, I've been wanting to meet John Travolta forever. And we met and he really and truly is one of the, of the nicest people in movies that I've ever met next to Clint Eastwood, of course. And he's, it was just absolutely incredible. And all he wanted to talk about was Mickey Gilley and Johnny e. Lee and Urban Cowboy out of all the movies that he's done. And so we had great conversation. We had that in common. He loves country music. And he invited us the next time we come down to come out to his house. He has 
his runway is going into his home. He has his jets all right there at his house. So I'm going to take him up on that. I'm maybe one of these days and go see that. But uh, yeah, I can imagine that it erupted when he walked on stage with the Bee Gees. Good Lord, what a powerhouse show that had to have been. Well, you know, I, re- I remember, like, like you had said, country music exploded from that yeah. point on. Yeah. And I think it was up until, so it was, so Garth Brooks and Alan Jackson, that was the 1990s, correct? Right. Okay. Right. Late 80s, yeah, early 90s. Yeah, so when, when the early 90s rolled around, country music looked like it was never going to slow down. And I was hearing rumbles from other genres in the, in the music industry they were wondering, are they ever going to be able to slow country music down just so they could get some radio airplay? Because a lot of the genres were kind of kind of yeah. laying off to the side because country ruled everything. Well, you know, it's amazing that it's, to a certain extent, it's still that way. Um, I mean, today, because music has changed directions quite a bit in country, country music of today is more of a pop, 70s sound uh, like it used to be in the 70s and 80s but the fan base i remember going out on tour we we did what we call the folgers waking up tour and it was the judge's farewell tour okay and garth brooks was opening the shows and let me tell you i had to go on after him you can't go on after garth brooks i mean it's pandemonium it was just an explosion when garth came on the scene uh i have never seen so many flowers on a stage in my life i bet it was five feet tall people throwing roses the women but it it was just an exciting time for country music back then and uh but you know garth and those guys brought a whole new audience into country music that we would never have had you know, Garth Brooks, he was basically signed to his record contract because the record executives had seen how powerful his stage show was and saw right. the reaction of the crowd. Right. Well, you know, Garth Brooks was just one of the, I mean, here's a guy, people always say to me, how did he get so big? He uh, had a degree in marketing. He was very smart in knowing how to market himself and how to sell himself to the public. And he mastered that. And he's continued to do it through his career. I mean, when you go out there and sell two and 300,000 tickets, not everybody, unless you're Taylor Swift, of course, mm-hmm. but I mean, he, he knew how to do it, but he, uh, he really and truly brought, as I said earlier, a whole new audience into country music that we never would have had, you know, and there's been others like that, that, that did that. Taylor's Swift has done that. Uh, gosh, uh, there's only been a handful that has really altered the course of country music, but Garth was one of those people. Yeah, you know, and you, it's funny because I look back now, Taylor, she's one of the very few artists, and it's hard to put her in a category now, but... Right. She's one of the very few that went global. Oh, yeah. And I mean, to go and sell out an arena five and six nights in a row and have a tour that grosses over a billion dollars. I mean, I think Elton John has done that and Beyonce maybe, but Taylor is holding, she's she's breaking records everywhere. And- well- well, for you, did you ever tour overseas? I did some, but very little. Uh, it wasn't, back then it was a different, different than it is now. Uh, it was more expensive. Well, it's still expensive to take a tour overseas. But the record companies concentrated more on uh, North America, U.S., than they did Europe. And through the years, Record sales have been, have continued to grow overseas and in Europe. I never did really establish myself in Europe like I should have, but hey, maybe there's still time. Maybe I should go over. Well, uh, you know, Canada is very big 
in country yes. music. Did you tour Canada? Oh, so, yeah, yes. I, I, matter of fact, I'm in Nova Scotia and some other places coming up. Uh, but yeah, Canada is a huge country market. And, uh, but as far as uh, I, I've been over and done things, TV and radio and stuff in those markets in London and Paris. But uh, as far as a concert tour, I never did tour Europe. You know, much like Elvis, he never toured Europe, but he couldn't because Colonel Parker wasn't a U.S. citizen and he couldn't go without Colonel Parker going. So, but yeah, the, the European market is, is a huge market, but I, I wish I had concentrated a little more on it. Than, uh, but hey, I'm happy with right where I am. Well, since your phone is ringing off the hook with so many uh, people wanting you to uh, come to their city, and uh, I know that you could just put up a 200-date tour instantly. So what's the plans for 2024? You know, I just want to go out and have fun. I don't want... I'm fortunate now in my life and career to wear... I don't have to be dictated to from a record label standpoint or, I mean, we're in-house management. We have our own management company, our own record label. We control what we do. And I'm afforded a great luxury of just going out now and not having to compete uh, with record labels and uh, other things that get involved with, with making music. I'm able to go out there now and just have fun making music and do shows. I still love doing concerts. There is no greater feeling than walking on stage to a crowd that's really with you and into what you're doing on that show. And there's nothing worse when they're not with you, trust me. But to be able to go out there now and do that, it's a drug. I mean, it really is. It's something that you miss when you're not on that stage. The traveling kills you. It is horrific. It, it makes you lose your health. It, it can beat you up so bad. But if you learn to pace yourself through the years, and once you get to that point to where you can go out there and do your own thing, uh, it's a lot more fun. And so for me, it's a continuation of what I've been doing, but being able to enjoy it more uh, because I don't have the pressure on the road that I used to have. I don't have to wake up on Mondays and wonder if my record has lost its bullet on billboard. Uh, it's just wonderful. It's wonderful times. Well, I know that a lot of the nineties artists I'm seeing they're teaming up together for like tour dates. Uh, what about you and maybe some of the other eighties uh, uh, recording acts of, are you, are you going to be teaming up with anyone for the, uh, this year? Well, we have a TNT tour this year with uh, T. Graham Brown will be with me on my shows. It's the TNT tour. And Kelly is going to be joining us on some of those shows with us. Um, I, I work with a lot of artists. I work a lot with uh, Johnny Lee, and I used to work a lot with Mickey Gilly. And occasionally there's a, a show, a promoter will add several artists on a show. It's not necessarily a tour, but it's a, a show like I, I just did the Kentucky State Fair not long ago with the Oaks in Louisville. Huge show. And uh, so anytime I get a chance to play or do shows with artists of my era, uh, it's an honor and a privilege because the crowds are just so huge when you put more than one act together of that era on stage. Well, I also understand that you have a brand new website, tgshepherd.com. What can all yeah. of your fans and new fans find there? Well, you can find all of the tour dates, the tour schedule. You can find a lot of news. You can, uh, we have a store there with merchandise and things. We have the, the new uh, uh, TG Shepherd party time tour shirt that people always want to get a party time shirt. A lot of our music is there, of course, and DVDs and uh, but it, it, it's just a place to go and just uh, stay a while and have fun, look around and see some old videos, or you can go to our YouTube channel and, and check out uh, content that we put up every week or two, old, uh, old interviews. I ran across a picture the other day of Michael Douglas and I on the Dinah Shore show. And uh, yeah, wow, it's just great to see that. And uh, a lot of NASCAR stuff we put on there with our race cars that we used to have. 
So, uh, no, I, uh, I, the website is a great tool. Social media, I wish we had had it back in my days of the 80s and 90s. Uh, and I think that's the reason a lot of artists of today are so huge is because they build these gigantic followings off of TikTok and Instagram and, and Twitter and uh, YouTube. There's more avenues to reach people now that we didn't have back in the hot days of when we were out there. But uh, I invite everybody to go to the websites because I, I, I go on there myself and find things that I didn't even know was on there. So uh, I hope people check it out. Well, TG, it is always an honor and a pleasure to, to have you on the oh. show and uh, just to talk with you and find out n new stuff and new stories because you got it all. Well, you know, I can't leave our interview today without mentioning the passing of Toby Keith. Uh, I woke up to that news uh, and I am hurting today a little bit. He was one of the giants who has left us way too soon, but he has left behind a great legacy with his music. I always loved him because he marched to his own drum. He was a great patriot to our country and to our men and women who serve our country. And so um, I'm glad you let me mention that today. It's oh, absolutely. I mean, Toby Keith had 20 number ones. Yeah. He had 22 in the top 10. Yeah. And I mean, songs that we will always remember. And I, I bet his songs are just climbing climbing oh. the charts and the numbers on Spotify and iTunes oh, right you know now. It. I mean, I always loved, I love the writing. He was a great songwriter. I love the song, How Do You Like Me Now? Or Solo Cup. No one in this day and time or forevermore will pick up a red solo cup without thinking about Toby Keith. Yeah. <laughs> what a great talent, but uh, he may be gone, but never forgotten. That's never right. Forgotten. Yeah, yeah, what what a superstar. And yeah. uh, TG, you're a superstar in your own right. Again, yeah. 21 number ones. Can't take that away from you. Well, I've been blessed. I'm blessed to have friends like you, too. And I tell you, I really love what you do. Man, you are just awesome at it. It's always a privilege to get a chance to visit with you and get caught up. Well, it's always a pleasure to talk with you, TG, as well as Kelly. I, I think yes. both of you probably hold uh, the Dr. Ward Bond show record for the most appearances, <laughs> which is fine with me. So if I ever need a co-host, I'm coming to you both first. You, anytime, my friend. I would be honored. I would be honored. And, and thank you for your encouragement of us doing our own podcast. I, I, I appreciate your encouragement on that. We hope to have it up and going in a few months. Well, I, I'm thinking now that uh, prior to our uh, interview, I, th I think maybe you need to start thinking about uh, doing a, a streaming show okay. and, uh, and go big. <laughs> okay. Go, well, go I'll, Garth, I'll go Garth Brooks big. <laughs> I'll follow you. I'll go big like you. So good, to, so good to see you today. You too, TG. And hey, ladies and gentlemen, head over to TG Shepard's brand new website, tgshepard.com, for all of his music, all of his tour dates. And I can tell you something. I know people right now, promoters are knocking his door down to try to <laughs> book every day of the year. And that's no lie. And I'm being serious here. It's true. So get on his website, tgshepard.com. Check out those tour dates. Buy a t-shirt, buy a sweatshirt, buy all the goods, and so much more. But more importantly, hey, when he comes to your city, you got to buy the concert ticket and go enjoy some of the best country music your ears will ever hear. And again, much love to you, uh, TG, and uh, to your better half, Kelly. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you soon. Hey, you bet. When I come to Nashville, I'm ringing your phone number. You got it. Come on. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for watching and listening. And as for me and TG, because I'm sure he'll be back, we'll see you next time.